Hello everyone! A month ago I made a high-level diagram for Aldebaran to present a rough estimate of how it's built and what kind of new features are coming. Today I want to showcase a new high-level diagram for Aldebaran to present a rough estimate of how it's built and what kind of new features are coming. As one can tell it's basically the same thing, but I felt the need to refine the diagram a bit and to make a video adding more commentary. All of the information is based on open source compiler and driver patches from AMD. Personally, I'm not tracking all of that and usually I see that information via Pharonix, where Michael is doing a great job at posting news and benchmarks for Linux related content. I saw some other patches via video cards, which got the information via Silicon Stream, who as far as I saw writes great news and summaries, mostly about technology from AMD and Intel. But you have to use Google Translate if you are not able to read Japanese. That said, Aldebaran is described as having two chiplets. They should be identical and each chiplet appears very similar to the CDNA1 predecessor, Actrius. Let's do a short recap. Actrius is a large and monolithic chip, the first and only CDNA1 ASIC used for the MI100 product. The chip has 8 shader engines, each one includes 16 compute units, so in total there are 128 units. To improve the yield, AMD disabled one compute unit per shade array, meaning that the final products have 120 compute units in total. Those units are managed by various command processors, which are found in the middle of the picture. In addition, the compute units share 8 MB bytes of L2 cache, which is physically roughly divided into two portions, one 4 MB byte chunk is at the top and bottom. Moreover, the chip has two VCN instances for video decoding, which according to AMD are sometimes used for workloads which operate on multimedia data. For the external memory, HBM2 was chosen, which is not showcased here, but the physical links to it. There are four 1024-bit connections. The HBM2 system for the MI100 provides over 1.2 terabytes of bandwidth and offers 32 gigabytes. So each HBM2 stack has 8 gigabytes. Obviously, we can't tell yet how the floor plan on Aldebaran looks like, but I imagine it has many similarities with Actrius, which is why I based the chiplet pictures on it. According to Kepler L2, each chiplet has 128 compute units as Actrius. However, based on the cache configuration data, the L2 cache is shared by 14 compute units per shader engine, so for the MI200, AMD will disable 16 compute units per chiplet, ending up with 112 CUs. With two chiplets, the product would have 224 compute units. It's of course possible that this claim is wrong and that each chiplet has physically less than 128 compute units, but I think that's unlikely. While the amount of compute units per chip is very likely the same as on Actrius, the compute units themselves are heavily augmented. For the first time, they will support full rate 64 bit operations for floating point math and packed math for 32 bit instructions will also be available. Furthermore, the matrix engines were improved too. I will talk about the compute units in more detail in the next video. Right now, let's look at other high level attributes. As on Actrius, there are 8 MB bytes of storage for the 2 cache per chiplet, and the VCN engines appear to be the same. Instead of version number 2.5, it's now 2.6. However, the main difference here is simply that VCN 2.6 is connected to another multimedia hub than it was on Actrius. The video engines themselves were likely not improved as such AV1 decoding is not included. As on Actrius, each chiplet has four unified memory controllers, each one handling eight memory channels. However, instead of HBM2, the MI200 will use a newer memory standard, which memory vendors like to brand as HBM2E, where the E may stand for extended. The advantages are faster transfer speeds and especially a larger storage capacity per layer. Instead of one gigabyte, each DRAM layer provides two gigabytes. One memory stack has eight layers, as such it provides 16 gigabytes in total, and since we have four per chip, that means each chiplet has 64 gigabytes attached to it. With both chips, we are talking about 128 gigabytes, that's four times as much as on the MI100. Now I want to directly address the big elephant in the room. I'm casually talking about chiplets, but this is the big deal, right? Other brand is using two chiplets. If I may simplify and limit the history to GPUs, multiple chips, at least on the printed circuit board, are not something new. 
Already in the 90s, companies like 3DFX and ATI used multiple chips. The reasons for it were the same as they are nowadays. As ROM produces larger chips on a wafer, the probability that manufacturing defects destroy a chip is getting higher. As such, the economics go down, which may force a company to keep the chip sizes small or to use a new process at a later time when the defect density is lower. Moreover, in cases where the yield is not a problem, the chip size limit will draw the line for the absolute performance. Current lithography machines manage to expose about 860 square millimeters, and beyond that, it gets tricky. So using multiple chiplets on a product is a way to improve the yields, to use new process nodes earlier on, and to increase the absolute performance ceiling. Exactly those and other advantages and these utilizing on a grand scale for the CPU products since then one in 2017. Other advantages include the necessary design effort and time investment. Since AMD just developed one CPU chiplet and uses multiple of those per market segment, while in the past it was necessary to develop multiple monolithic chips for the client and server market. Obviously, since many years, if not decades, people are wondering when GPUs will be built this way. As mentioned, in the 90s multiple GPU chips on a card were already used, but back then times were in many cases simpler. Geometry processing, for example, was done to a large degree by the CPU, while nowadays GPUs have dedicated fixed function and programmable logic for that task. The multiple units exchange data through a fast crossbar interconnection. In addition, the frame-to-frame -frame dependency was a lot lower, if not non-existent. While today we have many rendering pipelines which use previous frame data for the next one. One trivial example is for temporal anti-aliasing. Those are one of the reasons why the market never got a satisfying and future-proof multi-GPU solution till this day. Because in the best case, we want multiple chiplets to appear and work together as if they were one large monolithic chip. However, to achieve that, a shared memory pool and very fast cross-chiplet communication is necessary, the last point is the major showstopper of current times. Because of all of these challenges, we always had to live with some kind of compromises. Like even though scanline interleaf were quite well back then, texture data had to be duplicated, the memory pool wasn't completely shared, and later on geometry scaling would have been an issue, as it was the case for split frame rendering. So for about two decades, alternate frame rendering was a decent solution, where one GPU would render one frame, and the other chip the frame after it. This was relatively easy to implement, and led to good performance scaling for GPU limited cases. However, the input latency would increase, Frame pacing is very important to get right, and the effective memory capacity would stay the same and not double, since each GPU would store the same dataset and share nothing. Over many years, multi GPU rendering did some progress on the hardware and software side, though. It got a bit interesting again, at least on paper, when AMD focused on smaller chips targeting the mainstream market. In this case, AMD did not build a dedicated high end GPU anymore and address the market with a multi GPU solution as it was already done in the past. However, in comparison to before, AMD put more effort into the connection between the chips. The 3080-70X2 was using the first chips from AMD, which supported PCI Express 2, but the PCI Express switch on the board only supported PCI Express 1 speeds. That PCI Express switch got upgraded to PCI Express 2 on the 4080-70X2. That alone wasn't too exciting, However, AMD integrated a side port in addition, which added the same total throughput. Over that link, memory writes from one chip could be applied to both memory pools. And overall, the interconnection bandwidth basically quadrupled. Some may be confused by the throughput numbers in gigabytes on the PCI Express side, where AMD was stating 2.5 gigabytes per direction on the 3080-70X2 and 5 gigabytes on the 4080-70X2. However, that should be the transfer speed per lane in gigabits, and without the encoding overhead, the bandwidth for 16 lanes should be 4 and 8 gigabytes per second per direction. In total, 8 gigabytes by direction of throughput on the first card and 16 gigabytes per second on the other card, plus the same throughput on the side port. Nonetheless, this wasn't enough to achieve a fully shared memory pool at full speed. Each chip could already access its local memory with over 100 gigabytes per second. Moreover, the side port was never active on the final products. There could have been some interesting use cases for it, but back then multi-GPU rendering was basically an API hack 
and not part of the core spec. Developers had no direct control over the communication between the chips and AMD apparently couldn't realize a transparent solution which would be alternate frame rendering and so this whole idea came stillborn to the market. It then took till 2013 to spark the light of interest once again and this time the software side provided new opportunities with AMD's new explicit API, Mantle. The multi-GPU rendering was a core part of it as it was later on DirectX 12 and Vulkan as well. We got a couple of shiny marketing slides describing what kind of new possibilities are on the horizon, however it was obvious to most people that without a fast and low latency interconnect, nothing really meaningful could be realized. Furthermore, explicit support means explicit support. Exciting things don't work automatically out of the box and if they don't, only a fraction of all developers will have the resources to make it happen. As such it wasn't surprising that multi-GPU solutions for the consumer market died off. The story is a bit different on the professional rendering side and especially on the HPC market. There's a strong motivation to couple multiple cards or chips together and to have a better communication channel between them. Since a couple of years Nvidia brought NVLink to the market and AMD Infinity Fabric Link. With those links products can achieve 50, 100, 200 or even up to 600 gigabytes per second between two GPUs much more than with PCI Express. It makes cooperation between GPUs much more practical and shared memory can be relatively fast. However, especially on HPC cards, the chips can access their local memory with 1 to 2 terabytes per second and of course there's a last level cache internally where computers can exchange data even faster. So there's still a massive leap necessary to have multiple chips perform like a larger monolithic one unless you can circumvent this issue with some smart ideas. There's an older research publication from NVIDIA exploring the concept of a multi-chip GPU solution which is in 10% reach of a monolithic chip design. It's likely a paper which many recognize and already read. A GPU solution with four chiplets is modeled, where for wiring density and efficiency reasons a package level is chosen instead of putting the chips on a printed circuit board. Furthermore, this system has an aggregated neuron bandwidth of 3 terabytes per second. They simulated different bandwidth numbers between the chips, ranging from 6 terabytes to just 384 gigabytes per second. 6 terabytes are not providing any meaningful improvement, and 3 terabytes, to match your aggregated urine bandwidth, is the place you want to be at. With half the bandwidth, 1.5 terabytes per second, the performance penalty is relatively small, with 12% in memory intensive applications, but definitely notable. With 768 and 384 gigabytes per second, there's a massive performance drop about 40%, respectively 57%. For practical reasons, they went with 768 gigabytes per second for the baseline concept, since that would be relatively easy to achieve on a package level and burn less energy for the interconnection. Three enhancements are proposed to get away with just a quarter of the aggregated DRAM bandwidth. Number one is the inclusion of a new cache structure which would store remote data accesses and reduce the cross-chiplet communication bandwidth by 28% on average. The next augmentation would localize the workload scheduling. Instead of potentially distributing the warps of a compute kernel across all chiplets, they are divided into four groups, one for each chiplet. That again would increase the data locality. The last improvement follows the same line, where first touch policy is improving the data locality as well. The memory pages which are first accessed by a chiplet are then allocated on the local memory partition of that chiplet. For memory intensive applications, all enhancements together improve the performance by 51%. So instead of a 30% performance penalty, due to the relatively slow crosslinks, the degradation is just about 10%. Now obviously, we are wondering how AMD will solve this issue for Aldebaran. First I'd like to mention that Aldebaran is not a GPU, it's a computer accelerator for vector and matrix code. Already with CDNA1, AMD removed nearly all of the 3D hardware, there are no geometry engines, rasterizer, render backends, and most of the texture mapping logic was stripped away. As such it should be easier to realize a chiplet solution where you don't have to think about geometry and rasterization distribution, 3D state tracking, and then to advance and synchronize work. For RDNA3 though, AMD obviously had to solve those challenges and we should see the results in the second half of 2022. The chiplet solution for RDNA3 will likely have multiple differences in comparison to the implementation on Aldebaran, which should be revealed in a few months. 
just from the current open source drivers, nothing special is sticking out in that regard. There's no mentioning of a new cache structure or changes on the scheduling side. Although there's a new scheduling mode, but it's not intended to improve the data locality. The only aspect, which is stated, is the fact that Aldebaran will use two chiplets. One chiplet is in the primary mode and the only one who is allowed to fetch power data and to set limits. Responsible for the power, clock, thermal control and more is the system management unit. Under Aldebaran, it has the version number 13.0.2, which is the highest version number currently used by a chip. The upcoming RAM brand APU with 8 Zen 3 plus cores and 12 RDNA 2 compute units is using the version number 13.0.1. Cezanne used 10.0.2 and named these RDNA1 and 2 GPUs, together with Actress, the first and only CDNA1 chip used the 11 number series. That said, I think only the primary die will communicate with the CPU and the chiplet nature of Aldebaran will be abstracted away. The crosslink between both chips should provide a lot of bandwidth and low latency communication. In 2015, AMD already talked about the challenges with conventional GDDR memory and similar solutions. The gap between the compute throughput and provided memory bandwidth for a fixed power budget is getting larger and larger since decades. It forces the whole industry to tackle it on and many techniques are used to reduce the necessary data traffic as much as possible. However, there's only so much you can do and innovations on the memory side itself are heavily needed. That's when memory vendors and other companies like AMD worked on a new memory standard called High Bandwidth Memory. Instead of using a relatively narrow interface and to run it at very high transfer speeds, HBM is doing the opposite. It uses a very wide interconnection per memory stack with over 1000 data pins and combines that with relatively low transfer speeds which helps a lot with the efficiency. Though the question is of course, how do you connect multiple thousands of wires on a conventional organic substrate? The simple answer is, well, you don't. To make it a reality, the vendors bit into the sour apple and they're using a silicon interposer for the interconnection. The same raw material which most computer chips are made of. This new intermediate layer between the package substrate and the compute and memory chips makes many things more complicated and expensive, but the benefits are enormous. The interconnection density is much higher and so is the energy efficiency in comparison to the package level. Most high throughput HPC chips are using HBM with an interposer. Naturally, it makes sense to use the silicon interposer not only to connect the logic chips and HBM together, but to also form a connection between logic chips. This should be the key to achieve a high speed crosslink, where the system doesn't exert a strong non uniform memory access characteristic. However, there are many questions which come to mind for Aldebaran. Because with two chiplets and eight HBM2E memory stacks, the interposer has to be huge. TCMC presented an interposer size of 2500 square millimeters for the year 2021, showing basically the same high level configuration with two logic chips and eight good question what HBM stacks. Other brand could look very similar to this depending on the die size of each chiplet. Because if 2500 square millimeters is the maximum size, then the logic chips can't be larger than around 600 square millimeters. The predecessor Actrius was built under the 7 nanometer node from TCMC and brought about 730 or even 742 square millimeters to the table. This is obviously too large and the question becomes what process technology AMD will use. The company stated early on that Zen 4 will use the 5 nanometer node, however for RDNA3 and CDNA2 they only mentioned an advanced node which could include anything. If there isn't a larger interposer size available, then 7 nanometer chiplets won't fit. There's a design compatible 6 nanometer fabrication process, where TCMC is claiming a potential logic density improvement of 18% in comparison to 7 nanometer. This improvement wouldn't apply to analog circuitry like the FICE, but let's omit this fact and apply an error reduction of 15%. It would lead to 630 620 square millimeters for a chiplet, still too much. Moreover, Aldebaran is not just Actrius times 2 it has many new features which require more transistors and chip area. From that perspective, the 5 nanometer node appears like the saving grace. The chips could be smaller than 600 square millimeters with all new features. In addition, it would heavily improve the energy efficiency. Overall, it seems advisable to use the newest process node, 
since the competition will roll out heavy artillery. As AMD, Intel won a deal for an exascale supercomputer in 2021 called Aurora. It uses two Sapphire Rapid CPUs and six Ponte Vecchio GPUs, where each one is a complexity monster. If you simplify it, it's not so different in comparison to Aldebarando. It uses two base dice, where compute and cache tiles are stacked on top, and those two high-level compute modules communicate with each other. As on Aldebaran, each high-level module is surrounded by four HBM stacks, so we have eight in total. The base dice are made on Intel's 10 nanometer super thin process. The cache dice, which Intel calls Rumbo Cache, are made under the 10 nanometer enhanced super thin node, and the compute dice are made on Intel's 7 nanometer process, and there will be potentially compute tiles from an external foundry. People who look a bit at the process technology know that the nanometer name is not an objective comparison point and to a large degree meaningless. For example, Intel's 10 nanometer process is much more comparable to the 7 nanometer nodes from TCMC and Samsung. In comparison to the older 10 nanometer manufacturing lines from the competition, it can achieve nearly twice the transistor density. The same applies to Intel's 7 nanometer node, which is estimated to be even denser than TCMC's 5 nanometer process. Perhaps this is based on Intel's previous goal of achieving 2.5 times the density, however, the target was reduced to factor 2. But even with about 200 million transistors per square millimeter, Intel should be decently in front of TCMC's 5 nanometer node. So it's not too surprising that Intel recently renamed the 10 nanometer enhanced super thin node to just Intel 7, without the nanometer unit, which I personally very like. It always led to wrong impressions. The message behind it is of course still very obvious. Intel wants to align the names to the competition. As such, the previous 7 nanometer node is also renamed and now called Intel 4. So Ponte Vecchio's main modules use a mixture of Intel 7 and 4, integrating over 100 billion transistors. That's nearly twice as much as on Nvidia's A100, which has 54 billion transistors. That chip is basically at the practical limit of TCMC's 7 nanometer process, coming close to the radical limit with a die size of 826 square millimeters. I tried to measure Ponte Vecchio, and each base die appears quite a bit smaller than that. However, as always I have to put forward a major disclaimer. We either have low resolution package and die shots from a product, taken from a skewed angle, or we have some marketing pictures in a better resolution, though oftentimes they are artistically touched up to obfuscate the real details or they are more or less completely made up. I use both. Let's first look at the marketing picture from Ponte Vecchio, which I had to straighten quite a bit on the open accelerator module. The module is 165mm wide and has a height of 102mm. Based on that, we can derive all other sizes. For the package I have roughly 77.86mm by 62.70mm. That's likely a little bit larger or a bit smaller than in reality. Anyway, what's immediately apparent are the different HBM sizes, and all of them are smaller than the package specs for HBM2 and HBM2E. Moreover, the aspect ratio for the green colored HBM stacks doesn't even come close to the real one. Let's just ignore this and measure the base dial. It's 535.08 square millimeters large. The area colored in red includes 8 compute tiles and 4 Rambo caches. That's the core part of the accelerator and just 304.65 square millimeters in size. The 8 tiles around it, which take over 230 square millimeters, are just passive dice without logic, according to Usman Pisada from WCCF Tech. They are used for structural stability. One obviously has to wonder if the base that couldn't be designed smaller and why such a huge amount of empty area is added. Some of it might be necessary if the compute tiles from the external foundry are a bit larger in height. Perhaps it's also helping out with the thermal performance of the accelerator. It's definitely an interesting design aspect. The pink tiles are for the XE Link. Now cross check with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger holding Ponte Vecchio in his hand. The angle was fortunately not that bad, however the resolution is terrible. For the package I typed in the same width as on the previous image and the height turned out nearly the same, so I kept it that way. Again, the different HBM sizes visible, however this time at least the cyan Carl tiles are close in size and aspect ratio to HBM2E package dimensions from Micron. 
since we don't have clear outlines, it's hard to make precise area selections. Once more, I ignored all shortcomings and oddities and simply went for it. The base dies around 584.93 square millimeters in size, 50 square millimeters larger than on the previous image, that's a difference of 9%. Looking at the red area shows a very different measurement. It's 377.52 square millimeters large, over 70 square millimeters more than on the graphical representation, leading to a difference of 24%. As a consequence, the area for the passive dice is now smaller and measures around 208 square millimeters. Back to other Baran again. From a competitive standpoint, the 5 nanometer node would be a great choice, especially to achieve chip sizes under 600 square millimeters, where a large silicon interposer can be used for a very fast interconnection between both chips. There's potentially another option called Corvus L, standing for chip on wafer on substrate local silicon interconnect, which is using a sensible and more cost effective method. Instead of using a giant silicon interposer, where only a fraction of the area is actually utilized for the connection between the chips, the interposer is instead replaced by an organic interposer. This interposer includes silicon bridges only at those places where high density interconnection is necessary. In relation to Aldebaran, there are two potential problems though. One is the timing of that technology. In 2020, TCMC stated a product target for a second quarter of 2021. However, quite recently, they claimed that Corvus L and R will be ready in 2022-23, which would be too late. The other issue is the size limit. As on Corvus S, about 2500 square millimeters is the maximum size which TSMC will offer in the near future. With 5 nanometer chips, that wouldn't be an issue. However, some voices on the internet claim that Aldebaran will not use the 5 nanometer node, but keep 7 nanometer. Color me intrigued if this is true, since I can't imagine that Aldebaran will not use a silicon interconnection between both chips. It's also hard to imagine that AMD could achieve a much better design density, which together with 6 nanometer would bring a chiplet size under 600 square millimeters. So I'm looking forward to the solution and surprises if there will be any. For this video, I'm going to make a cut here, but the rambling will continue and we will look at new platform features, changes on the microarchitecture side and so on. Till then, goodbye.